see you over there. Leslie Hervey, Clerk to the County Commissioners. Good afternoon. I'm County Commissioner Denise Driehaus. Jeff Aluto, County Administrator. Michael Friedman. Thank you all. Stephanie Summerall Dumas, President of the Board of County Commissioners. We will get started. We have quite a few things on our agenda uh, today. First item on the agenda is presentation of the county's fellowship and intern programs. Frank Fasaro. I put an extra, extra S on Fasaro. It's okay. <laughs> By an extra consonant. Yes. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I've got two uh, programs that I wanted to run through this afternoon with you. Okay. And uh, we can start with a public service internship program. And uh, as I've uh, discussed with you um, individually, made a, a number of changes from the initial program that I presented a couple months ago or so. Um, <clears throat> uh, probably the most um, important change is to include individuals with uh, work history in addition to those that are in an academic program. So it uh, gives us a broader uh, uh, pool of candidates to choose from and provide opportunities for. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, that's going to make the program a little richer. And also uh, then I included um, on the intern pay structure, uh, in addition to um, core um, uh, or academic credits to um, also identify relevant uh, demonstrated work experience. And uh, one last change I just uh, included, it's in my copy but not yours, is to include the Board of County Commissioners as one of the um, offices that, um, uh, uh, that uh, to which an uh, intern can be assigned. Okay. Okay, any questions? Uh, no, I thank you so much. I thank you uh, for, um, hearing what we wanted and, and what your department worked on and also being flexible to look at the uh, different ideas that we had and making some adjustments. So it looks really good to me. Um, I really uh, like the part about the part-time uh, fellowship um, to see where we are with them initially and uh, allow that to happen because we want to make sure that things are working out well before we look at the possibility of, you know, benefits or whatever for those that are that, that are here. But I will open it up. Um, Vice President Reese. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Frank, for working on this. Um, the goal of the fellowship was to kind of mirror what they do at the state with their fellowship program. And um, they do give you one year. Most of those people end up working for the count, for the state. Um, it's a different level of internship. Uh, it's just like somebody, they come here and get a job and they, they get one year and they leave. But this uh, fellowship program, they actually would be doing some work. They're not just walking around. That's true, yes. Yeah, um, I didn't actually um, uh, cover the fellowship program. If you'd like, I can give you a brief overview of that because I, I made some changes as well in, in that program. Um, one of the things I did was to include the Board of County Commissioners as one of the six-week core areas that, um, uh, that all of the fellows will complete in addition to the administration and communication and human resources and uh, budgeting and finance. So there's now four core areas instead of three. And the new one that was added was the Board of County Commissioners. And then in addition to that, uh, we had, I added four elective areas that um, include um, um, planning and development, criminal justice in the courts, um, environment and conservation, and I'm, actually, I'm going to go through all of them here. Uh, Board of Elections, Public Health, and Public Safety. So we've expanded the program, which was initially a 26-week program, to a 52-week program. But it's a, it's a part-time program for which a uh, fellow would work no more than 20 hours a week. Uh, we increased the rate of pay from uh, $25 an hour, which uh, aligns it with our Administrative Assistant 1 uh, classification, which is... Uh, makes the, the level of work uh, commensurate with what an administrative assistant would be doing. Um, and so when the fellow is, uh, is working on various projects, he or she will be compensated at a level 
it's um, commensurate with, with a professional here in, in the county service. And um, those are primarily, those are the, the major changes that occurred in the fellowship program uh, was the inclusion of the board as a core area, addition of the four elective areas, expansion from 26 to 52 weeks, and then increase in the hourly rate from 20 to $25 an hour. And in several of the agencies that are included in the program have indicated their actually enthusiasm for participating, um, and the few that haven't uh, responded yet plan to follow up with them and, um, and hopefully get them on board as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, I appreciate this. I think this is uh, uh, certainly, uh, I think this is groundbreaking for, for our county uh, to have a fellow. I don't know many too, too many counties that have it. I've seen it at the state level to have this fellowship and which creates a possible pipeline for us to having employees uh, hired for future employment. Um, and I think hitting all the levels of, from the internship area, we've got, you know, we go from youth to work to internship uh, and then to the fellowship uh, level. Um, I think we cover the gamut and we also educate uh, people more about what the county does and all the opportunities that they may not be familiar with. Most of the time when I talk to uh, students or been asked to talk to even adults, they say, what does the county do? And they are amazed with all the things that the county does and opportunities for career development uh, for people to be a part of. So I think this is good with capturing people early, we're getting them in, we're show, showing them, educating them what, what we have to offer, what they might look into, uh, how it might match their career set or things that they would want to be. Um, and I just think it's a, a great thing, and particularly at a time right now when people are having a hard time uh, getting people, people are looking for new careers, want to go a different direction, uh, and especially the young people that are coming out and those who are in college, they got different things that they're interested in before they make a career choice. So this is a great thing. We're forming a relationship with them uh, early on. Um, and so I, I think this is great. Thanks for working on this and uh, looking forward to getting this thing launched. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Commissioner Driehouse. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Frank, for putting this in front of us. And thanks, too, for responding to, I know, what you heard from all three offices as what, by way of adjustments. Um, I, I did think it was really important to get the county commissioners involved, especially uh, with the intern piece and the fellowship piece. And, and by the way, I've got an intern in the office this week for a few weeks. Her name is Julia Zhu. She was recommended by the Chinese Chamber of Commerce, and she's a Seven Hill student. Um, so welcome, Julia, to the county. Uh, She's been doing a lot of hard work already, and she's here every day until noon. So really grateful for her willingness to come down and volunteer um, as part of her ability to expand her knowledge about the county. And we're going to try to make it, make it as exciting as possible, uh, <laughs> as we always do. But um, you know, what's most impressive, I think, especially about the fellowship program, is the number of departments that are participating. I mean, when you talk about the enthusiasm, you've got 25 departments here, uh, which I think is really impressive. And I think it speaks to um, you know, the culture of the county and uh, acknowledging that we do want people to know what we do. We do want them to have a broad experience when they come down and interact with the county. Um, and so I'm very grateful and impressed that this many agencies are willing to do this because it's, it's a little bit out of the realm of what we generally do, but it's always worth it when you get a young person in that's interested in this work and it's fun. Uh, they have them in the office. So anyway, thank you for um, taking the recommendation and I'm really looking forward to this launching. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. Okay. Thanks. Okay. We will move forward. Item number two, community revitalization and community impact grants recommendations. Mark Von Altman. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, commissioners. And I have two presentations crammed into one today. She mentioned recommendations for the revitalization grants and the impact grants. It's, it's a lot of slides, so I'm going to have to move faster than I would like. But at the onset, I do just want to emphasize that um, 
a year ago, neither of these programs existed yet. And here we are already, these, these slides will represent $4 million in investments from the county directly into villages, townships, and cities. So I wanna commend this board for dedicating the funds for, for these projects. I wanna commend the communities for coming through with very strong applications. And then I also wanna commend um, the review committee uh, that went through these applications. A lot of them are here today for the impact grant. We have, uh, it was myself and Holly Christman and Chris Schneider, who's presenting a little later on. And then for the revitalization grants, we had, again, myself and Holly Chrisman, uh, Cheryl Floyd from County Administration, Steve Johns from Planning and Development, and then from Alloy, we had Harry Blanton, Catherine Fitzgerald, and Dan Ferguson. So with that, I will get started. Uh, first with the community revitalization grants and some overarching themes that have remained consistent as we want this program to be accessible to the communities that need it. And because we're using county general funds, we want to capitalize on the, their flexibility in meeting the various needs uh, throughout the county. Uh, projects, projects throughout the county are eligible, but uh, based on guidance from this board, we're, we're kind of aiming it at those first ring suburbs, as well as projects with uh, extreme financial needs. And for this year, we had a $3 million budget. That's double what we had last year. Uh, so an exciting expansion but really it's, it's a good thing we did it because uh, this time around we got $7 million in, in applications. So a very competitive round from 13 communities, 16 total applications. You see a, a large mix in terms of size and then also the, the project category. So eight infrastructure projects, six property development projects and two building improvement projects. And you can see here are all the property development and building improvement projects. Uh, we have the Cheviot, and Norwood, Gulf Manor, Silverton, and Springfield, they all applied last round. Uh, Blue Ash, Del High, uh, Loveland, and those were, those were our new applicants this round. And then here's all the public infrastructure projects. We had, we had a lot of park projects apply this year. Um, and, and again, Cheviot, Lockland, and Woodlawn uh, were repeat applicants. Uh, we were able to get new applications from Lincoln Heights, North Bend and Sharonville. And when we were going through all those applications, the, the review committee ranked them on four main criteria. Uh, so for, for the first one, project impact, we look at a lot of different things, but primarily we're looking at the number of jobs and payroll created as a result of the project, the total property, property investment resulting from the project, and then also if the project resulted in the removal of any uh, blight or nuisance. Then for project need, like I said before, geared towards economically distressed communities, but also uh, if, if they indicated the project is uh, directly aimed at supporting lower moderate income populations, for example, affordable housing, we would take that into consideration. Also, if it's um, a site that's gonna take a lot of environmental remediation before any new development can happen there, that would be a, a constrained budget and something we would consider as well for, for project need. Mark, can I ask about item Please. C? Yep. The criteria, is that a new criteria that was always there? The amount of light or nuisance? Was oh, that for, a, for project impact, uh -huh. light or nuisance removed? That was uh, I believe we considered that last year for project need. And, and really, these are just the main things. Uh, There's, I was just wondering. Okay. okay. Thanks. Sorry, I know you were on the roll. So oh, you're, <laughs> no. uh, please, uh, okay. questions no, at any point okay. are fine. Yeah. Um, so for project support, we're looking at the number of public and private ent entities partnering on the project, whether or not they've been able to commit funding or support letters uh, for the project. And then uh, you'll, you'll see in a lot of these, they mark implementation of, a, of an adopted local or county plan. Uh, that would also uh, illustrate project support. And then finally, applicant capacity, just generally looking at if it's, it's a complete application and the applicant is able to demonstrate they have all the things in place to, to execute the project. And as we go along with this year over year, we'll be, we'll be able to see the community's performance on these and, and we'll take that in consideration as well for applicant capacity. So now I'm going to get into the individual awards. I have slides for each. Um, I will say at the onset here that you'll see a lot of partial uh, funding recommendations. That's different from what we did last year. And, and this year that just, um, both rounds involved a lot of 
great applications, but this year the project just kind of the projects lent themselves to being able to scale up or down easily as a poll as opposed to an all or nothing. So we're able to get more funding to, to more places. So uh, that's just kind of how it played out. So Chevy had actually applied for a pretty extensive uh, facade improvement program throughout the Harrison Avenue business district. We're recommending funding at 150,000 for I guess maybe an initial round uh, to, to get things started. Uh, in their application, they included uh, support from the Shiviet Business Association, 21 businesses indicating that they're able to submit, match themselves for a variety of improvements, things like uh, new doors, new storefronts, uh, new awnings, new signage, uh, and, and everything in between. And really, this would be building on uh, um, some momentum that we have going in Shiviet. Uh, they have the Harrison Avenue reconstruction project that they're working on now with ODOT. And then also um, our, the recent Capitals building acquisition that we funded last year with one of these revitalization grants. And here you see an image on the left. Uh, that's from a recent mini planning grant study uh, showing the development priorities for the business district as well as all the commercial properties fronting Harrison Avenue. And then the right is just an image to give you a taste of the variety of storefronts you'll see throughout the Chevy business district. And, and uh, maybe get a sense of the, the various improvements that could come from such a program. Moving on, second project is in Delhi Township, and we are uh, recommending $600,000 for their one million request for a very large mixed-use development happening on uh, Delhi Pike. This involves the this involves new construction at a at a site that has a currently has an an old vacant grocery store. Uh, they're looking to bring things to that site like a fitness center, township offices, rec center, pre-K classrooms, and a, and a public plaza, as well as 180 new apartments. Um, this is something that they've been working on quite a while and would mark a major milestone in implementing their uh, plan, the Pike Strategic Revitalization Plan. They also have a lot of local funding tied up already in this project. We've actually supported in the past with a CDAP grant, um, but we're looking to kind of push the project even further towards the finish line with, with this revitalization grant. Can, well. I inter can I ask a question? Please. So when we have a project as big as this one, um, in the future, could you give us a general sense, maybe as one of the um, lines that you list, what the total spend will be on the project? You know, obviously it's not all county money, but any monies that are coming in, because this one is huge, right? This is, they're trying to redo all of Delhi Pike. And so um, if you could, it, like I said, just give us a general sense of how it fits in to the larger picture in the future um, that might help us put this in context. Okay. Um, or, or so, 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 we, so we have 66 million total property investment at the site. Um, like I mentioned, the, the county's been involved in the past with at least one CDOT grant, so oh, I, I can get you more, I I can get, um, I can get I you more information in terms of the, the county's kind of historical role. Um, and, and really this project uh, is probably going to be ever-changing until they actually put a shovel in the ground. But right now, they are, they are projecting 66, 66 million, million total investment for this site. I'm sorry, I just saw it. It was at the bottom and I wasn't reading the bottom. It's, it's, it's a lot of text on this slide. I, I, I apologize. <laughs> um, but the, so you see the, the apartments there in beige and then towards the back of the site, uh, the township offices, the rec center, the classrooms, and then the plaza kind of runs right down the middle there. If I have the... Okay, yeah, that's the button right down the middle there. Um, and, and you see today, I mean, just from that image, you can tell it would be a complete transformation of the site, hopefully bringing 180 new people to that Delhi Pike corridor, support the, the local shops and, and restaurants. <coughs> Moving on to uh, the city of Norwood. They uh, were recommending uh, the full $250,000 here for what would kind of be a um, uh, a, a local site readiness program, not all that different than the county site readiness program. These funds could go towards acquisition or demolition uh, for large sites within Norwood that they're looking to bring large job creation projects to. Uh, some of these sites they already own, others that they're, they're pursuing currently on the market. Um, but really in addition to preparing sites for future development, what it also does is it eliminates uh, blight and safety concerns. A, a lot of these happen to be in proximity to, to neighborhoods, so uh, kind of two birds with one stone here. And this is just one of the sites that uh, the funds may go towards. This is the old Perry and Derrick site off of Highland Avenue. Um, some of these 
buildings likely need to come down, others might stay. Uh, this funding may go towards partial demolition on this site. Gulf Manor uh, is, is our next award, and they're really looking to build on uh, the momentum that, that they have there, um, creating a site assembly near Weehee Road and Losantaville Avenue. Uh, they're looking to create a more visible business district there. And that, again, last year we were able to fund property acquisition with a revitalization grant. And sorry, I'm just gonna go ahead and already flip to this image. Uh, last year, they, and it's kind of a rough image, but what, 6514, 6516, 6520, that whole block there was acquired, or will, sorry, will be acquired with an award from their last year's community revitalization grant. They applied for community impact grant funds to acquire the one on the corner here, 2200. Uh, they didn't get it. Uh, we won't be recommending them for those community impact grant funds, but they were able to, to get the property under contract anyways. Uh, so right now they're looking to either pursue these properties to help fill in the, the gap there to create a 1.5 acre site or elsewhere in the vicinity of this, um, in this intersection to, to like I said, help uh, kind of form a new business district there in Gulf Manor. There's, there's a couple of small businesses in the area, but this would be almost starting from scratch here and, 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 they're, and they're well on their way. Uh, the the 400,000 wouldn't allow them to pursue everything that they have in mind, but, but some of it. Uh, Lockland applied for $250,000, $253,000. We're recommending funding for $200,000, and this would go towards pretty extensive um, streetscape and pedestrian improvements along Mill Street and Wyoming, Wyoming Avenue. And um, some highlights here is that it leverages $400,000 already committed in ODOT funding for this project. And you'll see... Um, the uh, things like street trees, enhanced pedestrian crossings, new sidewalks, new curb. They'll support uh, two important development sites. One, uh, the Mill and Dunn Business District uh, here, Mill Street running north and south. There's some small businesses here already. There's room for a lot more. These, these improvements will increase the, the marketability of those storefronts. And then also the, the village-owned lock site here. They're working with Nyer Properties to market this towards a, a larger uh, end user, and uh, again, just these improvements going away and, and help them making a little bit more marketable of a site there. Okay, uh, North Bend, uh, we're recommending the full four hundred thousand dollars for this acquisition of a large thirteen and a half acre site. Uh, North Bend, for some time, has identified the Harrison Tomb and the Ohio River as their two main assets. And this acquisition would allow them to kind of tie those two together and construct a, a riverfront park uh, that would include playgrounds and an event lawn and, and various other amenities. Um, th there's, this would fund the acquisition. They are seeking, they're working with Congressman Shabbat's office on funds to cover the construction portion of the project. And uh, this would also uh, mark the implementation of a, a previous uh, mini planning grant exercise. So you see here is a, an image of the site, the tomb site kind of towards the north, uh, the riverfront down here. And um, the idea is just to, to tie these two together as, as, as much as possible. I mean, there, there's the MSD facilities, there's a railroad. So there's, there's challenges to, to, to overcome, but um, North Bend is, is willing to take the, the long and hard road to do this because, like I said, they've, they've identified these two as their most important assets, and, and they'd like to build off of them. Can I ask a question about this one? Please. So I received an email from a member of this community talking about this property being in the floodplain. And so was there any um, discussion about that and uh, the concern that a floodplain property might not allow itself to be used in this way? Or, or how, how was that brought to you from the community? Yes, yeah, we, we, we received the same correspondence and, and we were able to look into that. Um, a couple of different responses there. Um, this, doing uh, kind of a, a more passive recreation area here is, is maybe the, the most apt land use for, for an area that's in a floodplain. Uh, not all that dissimilar from like smale uh, per se. There wouldn't be any um, 
serious like construction going on here in terms of vertical construction. It would just, like I said, playgrounds, event lawn, something that if, if, if and when there is flooding, um, it's able to be cleaned up and, 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 and no major damage to, to repair. Um, if they have looked into, um, with the Army Corps of Engineers looking at a flood wall, because they, they do list an interpretive center on this site, that would be kind of in a more distant phase two and not constructed unless there was more uh, invested in, in bringing some sort of additional flood wall to the site. And um, re we reached out to um, the county's EMA department and, and, and we had planning and development on our review committee and the, the consensus that um, if it, if it is kind of a more passive recreation site that um, that land use is is uh, apt to, to to being in the floodplain. So that those were our thoughts there. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Springfield, uh, they are working on the rehab of an of a vacant bowling alley kind of right smack dab in the middle of their commercial quarter there on Witten Road. Uh, they requested $670,000 and we're recommending $500,000. Uh, again, this would, uh, I, I guess I should say first that they're working with um, a brewery who would also bring lo uh, food vendors to the site to so hope to kind of create some more uh, traffic and vitality there on Witten Road. Um, but it would, it would mark three, over three million in, in investment at the site total. Um, it's, and it would also serve as implementation of their Springfield Comprehensive Neighborhood Master Plan. And um, here's, here's the site and uh, kind of the, 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 the cherry on top, I guess. Uh, you see the mural and the plaza there and the background that was funded with a previous CDAP grant and and by preserving this building, I, I mean you can't do a lot of different things with an old bowling alley, but they've found a brewery that's able to make it work. And and by making it work, we can we can save this mural in this plaza that the county previously invested in as well. Uh, at the same time, bringing jobs to the site and and breweries can be fun places for communities to have. <laughs> Uh, last project is Silverton. Can I ask about that? Just, yep, not, sure. not about the last okay. comment. Right. Right. <laughs> See, everybody's getting happy about a happy hour or something. Bre breweries um, are a leading indicator of economic development. I, I could have I could have worded it that way, I guess. We're for the, yeah. we're for yeah. the breweries. Yeah. 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 But I just want to put an asterisk and so maybe you could get something to us. I noticed that we're losing a lot of bowling alleys. Yeah. Um, and um, just, you know, just kind of concerned about it. Um, so I know Colerain, and I know now uh, Brentwood Bowl, obviously, Colerain. So I just wanted to maybe just to know, like, is there a trend of us losing bowling alleys and what's kind of going on? I know most of them are mom and pops that have been around for years. I don't know if COVID wiped them out at the last straw. So I just wanted to kind of just get some background and understand, because, um, you know, bowling alleys, roller skating rinks, all those kind of things. Um, a little just concerned about what's going on with them. So uh, just the asterisk to get some information on, is this a trend that's happening? Certainly, and as we roll out um, a lot of new and improved tools related to small businesses, maybe it makes sense to, to tweak some of those specifically to some of these industries that we see a, a pattern with, maybe. So we'll do. Okay, Silverton is the last project, and it's a, it's a pretty extensive one. They're actually looking at developing uh, a land trust over several blocks of the Silverton Business District. Uh, this could be a kind of a new model for redevelopment for, for Hamilton County. Uh, what this project would result in, uh, at least as, as planned, would be um, condos, townhomes, uh, approximately 130 new apartments, new commercial space, and, and some surface parking. And it would, uh, it would be an extensive project with $28 million in property investment. And uh, the, the village of Silverton has committed to including affordable housing within the project. And uh, the development allows current residents to, to the, the option to build equity as part of the project or what happens in other cases, they're, they're also able to, to sell and, and, and move elsewhere. But they would have two options in this case. 
So here's uh, the site today. You see Montgomery Road running diagonally uh, through the middle of the, the screen and the three blocks to the south there. So one, two, three. Uh, that's what, what would be involved with this land trust. Uh, you have some park space there, some single family <laughs> homes, some multi-family multi homes, some commercial space and some car parking slash storage. So um, it's, it's a rough rendering, but here's what's, um, they're currently thinking for the site, and there's been an extensive uh, community engagement process already in kind of visioning this, but there's still a ways to go as well. Uh, but you see the, the, the condos off to the left there. These would be condos, townhomes, apartments on top, and commercial space on bottom with uh, surface parking. So I have a summary here of all the revitalization grants. Uh, like I mentioned, a lot of partial awards. Um, Really, in the end, these were the eight projects that hit those four criteria, the, the, the best that I mentioned earlier. Uh, happy to answer any, initial, any additional initial questions at this point. Uh, if not, I'll move on to the Community Impact Grant. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm just really excited about the partial allocations. We talked about that, that before we were, you know, given the full or in, and other entities were not getting anything. And so I really like the partial because um, I mentioned to Jeff earlier today, if we can just get a list of where other allocations are coming from for community investment, because a lot of those that are up there, I know when I was on the state capitol, um, grant um, infrastructure task force a lot of them got money from us uh, from the state so we just need to keep track and make sure that the same entities are not getting money over and over so I'm really excited about that I'm also excited about the fact the ones who were not approved how you guys are providing technical assistance for those who didn't make it and how they can um, what they need to do to kind of uh, be able to uh, qualify the next time so I appreciate that um, Vice President Reese, any questions on this presentation? Yes, uh, thank, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for uh, your hard work and implementing the, um, the feedback from the board. Just have a couple questions. I want to go back to the part about the, you said there was a lot of park investments. Are these private, like I guess, are these part of Hamilton County parks, which we don't control, but or how is that handling? Because I know there was a parks levy that passed. Did they get any of these dollars, or is this just belongs to the the city or the village? Let's see. I, I, as far as our recommendations, the only uh, park project that we're recommending for funding is North Bend. It's my understanding that that would not be a Hamilton County park. That would be a, a local park. Local parks. Okay, that's what um, I just want to make sure. And then for the other applicants that applied, uh, for park projects. I believe the vast majority of those would have been local parks too, um, if not all of them. I don't know if, sorry, I don't know if that answers all of your question. But, yeah, uh, I just wanted to make sure you had mentioned, you said we've got several parks yep. in here that we yep. were doing. So maybe I misunderstood what you said. Yeah, no, no, all, all, all parks and, and the majority of them, based on the application, seem like they would be local parks, not Hamilton okay. County parks. Okay, mm -hmm. just wanted to make sure of that. Um, the next question that I had, uh, while we do encourage the partial, I just wanted to make sure that we're not like uh, community development block grants. We gave some dollars and then the project couldn't finish. Do we get indication, um, you know, how did you come up with this number? Was it just, you know, pie in the sky or did we talk to the folks and say, if we get this number, you can finish the project? I. I, I I followed up with all of the applicants that we're recommending partial awards for, and all of them informed me that the project would, would still be able to move forward. Um, now, that being said, uh, in, in f the amount of inflation going on right now, I, I, I guess I can't guarantee that there won't be continued road bumps, but we, we made sure to follow up with all of these because this program is about impact, so that's the last thing we want to do. We want to sink funds and have something continue to sit. So. Right. Um, they all report to us that the project will move forward and we will have reporting requirements in their grant agreement so they can document our progress to us, their progress to us, and um, we can take that into account for, for future awards, I guess, if they don't uh, live up to the timeline that's indicated in the agreement. Okay, that's good. I just wanted to make sure you were going to do some kind of follow-up with them. Um, like you said, it could be inflation, it could be other things, but we don't want to 
pass the money and it's just sitting there and then we're on to the next budget cycle or what have you and yeah. the money is never got to the project um the other thing i just wanted to ask about was the um uh, which i think these are all great projects nothing against the projects but the um one in terms of can you give more clarity on the silverton project i love the idea of the mix commercial space etc um but we, are we looking at, we look at condos and townhomes, uh, will that be, uh, uh, I'm not asking for it to be low income, but I'm saying is this something that would help us with the affordable issues that we have in the county, affordable housing issues, or no? I guess what I can respond to as far as that question, they haven't, they have not given us the level of detail in terms of which units will be the affordable units if, if they're the okay. if they're the condos if they're the townhomes if they're the apartments they've they've talked to all the residents that are there currently yeah. i think the majority of the residents that are there the ones that wish to continue to live at the site have indicated that they're um, apt to moving into either the town homes or the condos um, i don't know all i, I i'm not as familiar as Silverton is on, on the, the details of this project, but um, they'd receive a, a, a signing bonus to, uh, to, to be involved with the project, and then also kind of their, their equity situation from their current home would transfer on to, to their new condo or their, their new townhouse. And then in addition to that, um, kind of the more unique part is that there's the land lease involved the, the resident would have a stake in that land lease. The developer that builds all of this is paying rent on that land lease, which is going to the owners of the land trust. So it's a, okay. there's the affordable housing component, and then there's also the equity component in, in terms of the land lease. Um, but they're not far enough along in their process that they can tell me, okay, it's 15% it's of the apartments, or it's 15% of the condos, or it's 50% of the apartments. Uh, they're, they're, they haven't built out their pro forma enough yet but we have the com we we have a commitment from silverton that will build in to the agreement as much as possible that they've committed to providing some level of affordable units within this overall development gotcha yeah i just reason i was asking just as we're putting that larger map together and if they're doing that with the affordable part i wanted to make sure that's included in the overall mapping in terms of what has Hamilton County invested in as it relates to affordable, that whatever uh, units or amount of units, that part will also be included um, in the overall mapping that uh, that I believe uh, Jeff is already putting together. Yeah. So it, it adds to our mm -hmm. numbers, just not that we're not in silos. You know, that's why I just wanted, I saw that and I said, make sure whatever that is, make sure that number is added to the overall map for the county. <laughs> That, that, that's an excellent point, and we'll have to do our best in not making the map too messy because there's a lot of different things going on with this project. There, there's, there's affordable units, but there's also market rate units, so we'll be sure to capture that as best we can in the, that online map. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mark, for the presentation. Um, and thank you to the panel. I, I can see that some of the members are here. Thank you for working on this. I can't imagine what it's like to go through so many really great projects and try to decipher which ones um, are going to fit the best for the funding. Um, and I do want to emphasize that, that this is money that we pass through the budget. This is the second year for these funds. And um, it's meant to catalyze economic development in communities. And so the, the nexus has to be there for um, all of these projects. And thank you for kind of connecting the dots for us on each and every one of these and letting us know how it fits into the, a larger uh, context for each community and what their vision is really for the business district, for, for a park or, or whatever it is. So thank you for doing that. Um, also, can you remind me, so in the, in the first time we did this was uh, two budgets ago. It was that 1.5 that we put in originally? You, you originally allocated, I believe it was, it was 1.5. It was then reduced to 1.1. When we presented our recommendations, it was for 1.1. And this board provided guidance that 
allowed us to up that to eventually 1.5 million total for the last round. So okay. a roundabout answer to say, in the end, yes, it was 1.5. 1.5, and then in this budget it was three. Yes. Because we had such a great, well, I don't remember what the request was last time, do you? And I apologize, I wanna say it was somewhere around 4 million, but I don't have that number. Okay, but it was, it was, it was well oversubscribed right. <laughs> last time, and it is again this time. Okay, and I'm just asking for, because if we were to include this now in our upcoming budget, um, I'm trying to get to what is the most appropriate amount to allocate for this, and it feels like we're in a good space, at least right now with the 3 million, um, so maybe uh, a conversation for a larger, um, context with which is the budget but if we want to continue to partner which is really what we're doing here is partnering with the uh, 48 jurisdictions um, to make sure that they've got money to catalyze projects in their communities and money that's in partnership with what the money they already have um, I just wonder from what you have seen now in these two rounds um, what is the need what is the capacity out there and what might we expect by way of a next round of these funds I, th I think you're uh, spot on. That is a larger conversation, but just initially I would uh, add that w I alluded to before that we received a lot of park applications and um, parks are important and they're taking on kind of a, a, a new meaning to communities amidst COVID and work from home and everything else. But a lot of the park projects that we um, decided not to recommend for funding, they failed to make that strong connection to jobs and businesses as well. The North Bend one, we just, we're just we hoping that can kind of be more of a regional draw to, to North Bend and, and, and really put that community on the map. For instance, in, in, uh, in Cheviot, they applied for two park-like projects and there just wasn't that connection to their business district. Mm -hmm. So that's why we chose not to fund that one. And Woodlawn, it's in proximity to their business district. They were close, but um, so all that to say, uh, strong applications that we're, we're not funding, but um, not any not any truly impactful economic development, like right on the nose, hitting all four of those criteria. So for that reason, three million turned out to be a, a, mm -hmm. a pretty good amount this time around. No, and I, I do wanna say I appreciate the, um, because this board, when we passed that through the budget, <coughs> made the connection to economic development, strong connection. Yeah. And so I appreciate that, that it was weaved into the criteria because we don't want to um, necessarily spend these funds outside of what they were planned to be spent, because there's plenty of need uh, when it comes to catalyzing the business district uh, out in these communities. So, okay, thank you very much, really appreciate it. Thank you, and I, I'd just like to make a comment about Silverton uh, specifically, I know when we look at Silverton, um, their diversity has decreased, um, their income level has increased, and a lot of that is because they're building homes that are three, four hundred thousand dollar homes. So, we, I don't personally want to uh, not be able to recognize uh, the neighborhood. Silverton is a unique neighborhood, and so economic development is great, uh, but we we don't want to push those out. Uh, that want to stay. Um, and so I know we talked about affordable housing, but also want to be able to maintain the ones that have been there. And so when we talk about more and more condos, it's going to be very, um, it's going to be something to watch as it relates to Silverton. If they're willing to go that way, fine. But um, that's not the Silverton that that I know, but maybe they're willing to do that. But it'll, it'll be if if um, implemented as proposed it'll be a, a sure. transformational project yeah there's nothing you can do about it mark yeah. but okay. yeah, I just thought I'd bring it up but okay. uh, you see more and more of those high price houses and so it's pushing the diversity out of silverton um so okay okay all right uh, let's if i can get my clicker to work here yep we will move on to the community impact grant program this is brand new uh to my knowledge the county really hasn't done anything like this in the past uh, whereas um, the community revitalization grant uh, projects throughout the county are eligible, this is even more laser focused on communities in need with limited capacity. So we only opened up the application to eight communities and you see them listed there on the slide. Uh, we feel like in these communities, uh, a revitalization grant would be great, but it's gonna take more than just one project to help them make that definitive step up the ladder in terms of economic sustainability. So hence the idea 
and the purpose of the community impact grant concentrate uh, a lot and a variety of resources in one place over a short period of time uh, and hopes to make a, a difference that you can see and feel. Uh, so that was our, our high aim with a uh, million dollars allocated for the, for the program this year. And um, with our application, we, were, we, we, we did three things. We, we tried to make it as simple as possible. Uh, we asked the community to provide some narrative on some of the structural challenges that they were interesting, interested in tackling with the county. And then three, tell us how they're going to match those challenges or challenge with some resources that we listed, kind of a menu of resources on the application. And whichever community did that in the most compelling way would, would be the one that, that ranks at the top. Uh, you see some of the resources listed on the application there, uh, consultant support, street improvements, uh, signature projects I don't have listed on there, but that was one, small business assistance. We tried to get a variety of things on there because, again, we, we know there's a variety of needs out in these communities. I'm aiming it wrong. Okay. Um, so we had seven of the eight communities submit applications, and that was kind of one of the more exciting parts right there, that the vast majority of these communities were, were willing to take a step up and partner with the county and tackle some of these structural issues. Uh, and we had requests, like I said, for, for a variety of those resources, um, road improvements, signature projects, code enforcement were some of the, the main ones, but they were just about all of them were covered. And then we had 3.8 million in requests, but really some of those requests came in without a specific dollar figure or quote attached to them, so the need's even larger than that. Um, so a good response. Here's the seven applications. You can see some of the communities requested four or five different resources. Others requested uh, just one or two, and the size and the ask varies greatly as well. Uh, so... Um, I'm excited it worked out this way that we can focus on one community because it wasn't guaranteed that it would be that way. But um, we're, we're recommending $975,000 in county investment into Lincoln Heights. Uh, so, so very substantial money. And, and if uh, there's a lot of things going on in Lincoln Heights, but uh, if this recommendation is approved, we'd be able to... Um, support uh, three different kind of areas. So uh, we'd be able to have funding dedicated towards road improvements that would help them jumpstart uh, an asset, a larger asset management strategy. Uh, we'd be able to provide additional funding for their signature memorial field project. And then also there's uh, funding included for a, a, a pretty large demolition remediation project for the, the village owned school there on, on, on Lindy. Um, Lincoln Heights submitted a great application, uh, talked about the, their six-point plan and how the, the various things that they're focusing on, on trying to shore up their, their shrinking tax base. So um, we're, we're excited for the future here. And I'll just bring up this map. And the first thing that stands out is just the geographic proximity of all of these things. Uh, here's the two roadway projects I mentioned. Uh, here's Memorial Field. Here's, here's the, the school site that would be uh, demoed and remediated. So there's the geographic proximity, but what you don't see on this map is things like uh, all, the, all the leverage involved in this. So there, uh, Lincoln Heights is doing a great job pursuing sort of funds, OPCW, OPWC funds to help fund these roadway projects. They're also working with the port to build homes on some of the vacant lots that are on these streets. Uh, the Reds and P&G are already involved at Memorial Field, and we're seeking state funds to, to help pull off that large uh, demo and remediation project. Uh, so a lot of different things going on right here. Time. Okay, uh, just a couple more images. Here's the, here's the school building that I mentioned. Like I said, a, a large building, so a, a hefty demo and remediation job, but, but a large site to work with once, once we're able to clear it. And, and the state funds that uh, the village and the port are currently seeking will be necessary to, to complete this project. Uh, 
or if like the batteries are dying or something. Um, and here's a quick image of Memorial Field. It's kind of hard to tell on the map, but a, lo a lot of different upgrades going on here. Uh, entrance upgrades, a walking path around the fields, stormwater infrastructure, and like I said, um, a lot of different private and public entities, ODNR, uh, getting involved in, in, in sprucing up this site. Uh, we do have one more impact grant recommendation. It's, it's much smaller, uh, but it's in, in the city of Cheviot. Uh, we're recommending funding for er, sorry, $25,000, and it's for a market study for the Capel site. Uh, so if you recall, the, the area shaded in red was acquired uh, just this past winter with a revitalization grant, and uh, what they're looking to do is, well, it, it's kind of a complex site in that there's, I mean, there's a storefront here, but really there's a lot of storage in the building. They do have some dedicated par parking, but it's accessed off a different street. It's also adjacent to this other city-owned parking lot. All that to say, it's, it's a complex site. There's a lot of things to consider. Uh, so we're, we're, they're requested and we're recommending technical assistance to get some more quantitative and qualitative data uh, to figure out the highest and best use for this site. Um, I'm almost done, so I'll just let someone else do that part, I guess. Um, so here's a summary of the, the impact grant recommendations. Like I said, the three line items for Lincoln Heights and then 25000 for Cheviot Market Study. Uh, these next steps uh, pertain to the impact grant and the revitalization grants. Uh, like uh, President Dumas mentioned, we're, we're going to be following up with a lot of the communities that we, we weren't able to fund and directing them to, to alternate resources if we can and, and see if we can meet their needs elsewhere. Uh, I'm going to, to take your questions today. We're going to incorporate that feedback and then um, we'll return on a, at a future uh, regular meeting to approve each one of these grant agreements individually. Uh, once, if the agreements are approved, once they're signed, the communities can uh, commence the, the projects. So. That is all I have on community impact grant. Put that down. <laughs> and um, thank you. Do so you have much. any more questions? Um, I'm looking at the storm for uh, Lincoln Heights the stormwater infrastructure. Um, of course, we need that up there. But what I was going to say is um, additional improvements. It doesn't, of course, have a, a, a value of how much. But I know they have no water. There's no bathrooms. I mean, for you the whole, what, 30 years they've been using that field with no bathroom and no water. No, so this is just awesome. Uh, they've been needing it for a long time. And so, um, as you were saying, they'll have to get other funding from other places, but I'm just really excited about finally um, <clears throat> that area is being recognized even more uh, to provide. It's worth providing the money for to build up that community. I always say it's a diamond in the rough. So just really uh, happy to hear about uh, Memorial Field and also the other um, projects that are going to be planned. Um, Vice President Reese. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I did have a question. Um, I want to go to, so Arlington Heights. I want to make sure I'm following this correct. So there's a request for $37,425. And then it has like a whole bunch of stuff they're going to be doing. Code enforcement, home repairs, road improvements, grant writing, signature project. That's a lot for $37,000. When they give them $2.50 a person per project, I mean, this is a lot <laughs> yeah, for yeah. all these elements. They're, I, they're, I mean, they're not need? extraordinarily efficient, actually. Um, it's, it's instead, uh, w we wanted to not have any unnecessary barriers for communities to, to work with us on this application. So we didn't make it a requirement to you to have a specific quote or price tag. Instead of saying we need $100,000 for code enforcement because we have X amount of citations a year and we have X amount of staff, we, we, we said that's preferred and your application is going to score better if you're able to provide that. But if it's instead, Arlington Heights just has 
the inclination that they could use assistance for code enforcement, they could just simply check that box and not put a dollar amount to it. So the 37,000, I believe, only pertains to an intersection upgrade and maybe one other smaller item. And the rest of those, they just kind of indicated that they were looking for assistance from the county on this. They didn't have a specific dollar figure in mind in terms of how much. Yeah, I just wanted to have, you know, we want to make sure they get in the tools, you know, that they need. And whatever we're doing, I just want to be more specific. Because when I look down here, I'm like, there's no way you can do home repairs, road improvements, grant writing, and signature, and a signature project for $37,000. I'm sure they have a greater need. So it just would be helpful for me. What is the 37000 that we're able to do? And then in the future, other things that are necessary, then we can kind of, you know, make sure that we're accurately reflecting what we are helping them with. Because I was just a little embarrassed myself as a county board, and we come in and say, we give in Arlington Heights $37,000, and you got all this stuff you got to do. I know that's not your intention, but just kind of be more specific. Here's what the 37000 is for, and then the other items. You know, if they need something else, I'm sure they'll work with your office, and then you'll get back with us. Just to um, to make sure I'm and I know it's said across. requested. I got what yeah. you said. Okay. I know that right. your presentation yeah. has something yeah. different. Okay. I'm just saying when you put this out there, it's public record. If somebody sees this, they say, "Man, why are Lincoln I had to do all of this just to get thirty-seven thousand? That's not necessarily true. I understand. maybe maybe um, next year if if the requests come in without a dollar amount associated with them, county staff can work to get. Uh, uh, an estimate to put in there or something. I got you. Okay. Yeah, I just I was just thinking that's yeah that caught my eye right away. So thank okay. you. Okay. Is that it? Yeah, that's okay. it. Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you. Um, so I'm encouraged that you know because of the ones that requested money, only two of them are getting money. Uh, the the um, Lincoln Heights and the Cheviot project. But as you have stated, it's clear that others have a great deal of need. They just may not be able to articulate it quite right. Um, and so I'm encouraged about the follow-up that will go on here to try to make sure that, as, again, this, is a, this was a budget priority that we put in the budget, and this is the first time we're rolling this out. So um, I, I know that we will learn from this process um, not only by way of Lincoln Heights and Cheviot, but also for the f folks that requested funding didn't get it, and hopefully they can request funding in the future and be more successful um, as they hone in on what their needs are and they're able to put those dollars. I think it speaks to the need. I mean, you've identified communities that really don't have a lot of infrastructure, perhaps, or grant writers on staff or accountants on staff that can really help them put this kind of um, formula together. So um, I'm looking forward to how we continue to help these smaller communities um, make a difference in their community in partnership with the county. So I, I'll be interested to hear your report back, right, as we talk about this. Again, it's going to be in the context of the budget. But if we're going to um, fund this again, it'll be a matter of how much uh, we fund it for and what your experience has taught you that can inform us as we make these decisions. So really appreciate the work done on this one as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as I was saying about, I was excited about the partial allocations. As we look at the community revitalization, we're trying to help a community to grow. And these community impact grants are, you know, I don't have a problem with not doing a partial because it, we, we're trying to make a significant difference in a community, whatever community we choose, to make a difference, to make them look better and be better. Um, so, so. Thank you so much for that. And I'm so glad we came up with it. Madam yeah. President, could I just ask sure. one, add one thing? I just want to follow up on uh, Commissioner Driehaus's comments. I think is great because the feedback and what we're learning helps us with you know how to tweak it and add. So I am interested in your um, feedback on what we can do. I mean, Elmwood and Arlington Heights. I mean, they're just out there and they're not getting as much help and support. Um, and I don't know all the programs that we have. Maybe this one didn't work for them, but maybe we, we've had people come before us and talk about nobody's applying for certain programs. So just if there's something else that can help them that we have currently, I don't know if it's with community block grant or what have you. I don't know all the rules and regulations. That's what you do. But if it's something else that can help them, um, you know, that they can be directed to this year, 
uh, I'm sure you'll do that, but I just wanted to highlight to, to do it because you're right, these entities, the smaller ones, less and less help opportunity to you know, know how to fill out all this stuff. So if there's something else they could get help with, I just want to put that on the table or uh, please, I'm sure you will, but please reach out to them. And then I'm very interested for future um, what other things, it might not be this, but it might be something else that we're maybe missing that you might want to recommend and suggest for us to look at as we go into the, as we're now looking at our, our budget for next year. Yes, uh, it was, it was a, it was a win kind of being able to get that engagement, getting them to submit an application in the first place. And, and now that we have that, we're not helping them through this impact grant, but, uh, we are working with planning and development on providing technical assistance in some shape or form to Elmwood Place, Arlington Heights, as well as a, a couple of other communities. So uh, working on that already and we'll certainly report back on how it goes. And they're a, a pretty small entity. So do you know their population? Would you happen I, to know that? I, I don't. Yeah, um, you... Arlington Heights is like in the hundreds, I think. But it's, I didn't hear you. It's, it's not a thousand, Arlington Heights. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. So they'll need to. Yeah. And what place? I, I'm not Jeff, sure. Jeff I can't is, remember. We're all guessing over here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I know what's my. And, <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. And so, you know, who asked for 37000 Well, they did because yeah. they're not accustomed to asking. So keep asking if you're listening, and we'll help you uh, so you can qualify the next time. Thank you so exactly. much for Thank your work. You. Can yeah. I just say one, one other thing related to uh, what Commissioner Reese said? So I think it, the, the germ of the idea of this was the administration's. Uh, I think we, we were of the opinion that we needed to do the revitalization grants, and the administration said, you know, there are some communities that can't even get to that point because they don't have the infrastructure to do it. And so it was a response to what you guys were seeing. And so to just to pile on, you know, maybe it, that's a continuing thread. You know, what are we learning? We all, we're always learning. Um, when we do these grants and these grant cycles. So uh, it's just going to continue to be uh, built on what you and the administration, that your, your team learns as we continue to go through these processes. And Madam President, I, I have for a prior census, I have 745 for Arlington Heights, but that, that may have been uh, Steve Johns and, and Chris, you guys may have a uh, more updated number for Arlington. So I don't know if. It, 827. Eight, eight, so, so close. Okay. Well, um, so I thank administration for coming, but I know we've all said that those smaller entities, they never get, rec not never, but they're not recognized as much as they should be. So it was a, a joint partnership collaboration like we do everything. So to come up with this impact grant. So thank you. Thank you. M Madam President, just. Mike wants to stay up there, I know. Don't <laughs> uh, just one other comment, just uh, in terms of the overall uh, grant, and this is again for the, the folks who may be watching at home, that the county has the ability to do these types of grants because of the Ohio Revised Code's authority that it grants in counties to um, provide grants, loans, and other programs for economic development purposes. So uh, for anyone who might be out there saying, how can the county do X, Y, or Z? There are specific authorizations in the revised code uh, for us to do specific economic development programming. And that's so to the point where Mar Mar specifically where Mark was talking about um, linking uh, certain park projects to economic development, et cetera. Uh, that's not just our desire, but there is some Ohio revised code elements of that too. So just for folks who may be at home watching, wondering thank you why we're that. doing this. Yeah. So thank you. Good clarification. Thank you. Okay. Mark? I'm just yes. kidding you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. you. See you later. Thank you so much. We'll move forward. Okay. Many planning grant recommendations. Chris Schneider. Okay. Thank you, Madam President. Steve Johns, Assistant Director of Planning Development. I just wanted to take a quick moment to introduce Chris Schneider, who will be doing this presentation. Okay. Uh, Chris joined us back in January, and he's just been a great addition to the team. Uh, he came from uh, PDS across the river, uh, mm -hmm. Planning Development Services. Uh, he has a wealth of experience. You'll find that he has a great demeanor, and uh, I think he really knows what he's doing, and he's going to be building a great team for us up there in Planning and Development. So thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you so much. Welcome, Chris. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Steve, for the nice words. Uh, uh, there you go. Thank you. 
it's a pleasure to be in front of you. As Steve said, I've been with the county for about six months and planning services administrator and planning and uh, community planning. And so my first time in front of you. So thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. I'm here today to talk about the mini planning grants and the recommendations from the selection committee regarding those mini planning grants. Um, you'll see a lot of what this grant is doing is setting the stage for a lot of the stuff that Mark just presented to you. So providing a planning component and that first step to get to where these projects can be implemented. So it's a good, good data to be on the agenda for that. So uh, Hamilton County Planning Development is recommending three uh, projects for a total of $110,000 for the many planning grants. Um, these are funded through the Community Development Block Grants uh, with the Housing and Urban Development Program. Um, we solicited these projects from uh, participating jurisdictions uh, within the county. Oh, there it goes. A little background on the uh, process for this plan. So we uh, solicited call for projects on April 29th. Uh, we received five applications as part of this project. The deadline was May 27th. Uh, the selection committee convened on June 8th. It included uh, representatives from the CDAC, the Planning Partnership, and the Regional Planning Commission. Uh, some of the criteria that this committee used to make the selection uh, probably sounds so similar to what Mark was just saying. Um, what's the planning capacity of the jurisdiction? What's the likelihood that the project will be implemented? Are there current initiatives underway? Um, will it use future community development block grant or home funds? And was there any collaboration with partners? Those are just some of the criteria. Quite right. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, so these are the five applications that we received. The red star indicates the, the recommendations from the selection committee. Um, the first three, uh, Village of Marymount was a uh, request to create a Dogwood Park master plan. Uh, Woodlawn in Wyoming were both related to a Springfield Pike corridor revitalization improvement plan. I'll get into a little more detail on those three in just a moment. Uh, the other two, the city of Norwood was a bike lane program implementation plan, as well as Springfield uh, Township for a comprehensive neighborhood master plan update. So to provide a little more information on the three recommendation, recommended, recommended projects, the village of Marymount has their upcoming uh, 100th anniversary in the year 2023. And so as part of their uh, that celebration, they are looking to create a plan for the Dogwood Park area uh, to help with that celebration. Um, it is recommended for $30,000. Second one is the city of Wyoming. Uh, they are, have requested a project to, to create a streetscape improvement plan for key areas along Springfield Pike, uh, specifically to the south of Springfield Pike, uh, adjacent to the city of Wyoming. Uh, Wyoming and Woodlawn have coordinated their applications to include a uh, uh, gateway area between the two jurisdictions to help with continuity along the corridor. Mm. It's $40,000 recommendation. And then finally, city of Wyoming uh, is very similar to the Woodlawn application. It focuses on their promenade area in the center of town, but then to the north along Springfield Pike and the beautification of that, uh, looking to create a plan once again with Woodlawn to help create that gateway area uh, between the two communities along that corridor. So that concludes my presentation on the mini grants. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm just really excited again. Yeah. Um, and I'm excited because uh, I know when I initially came here almost four years ago, we, all of our, a lot of our allocations were right within Cincinnati limits. Um, and so I'm so glad that we're going out and uh, recognizing all our Hamilton County residents. And um, secondly, um, just the fact that 
we are not sitting on any money, uh, <laughs> that the money is here, the money is flowing. We're making sure we have safeguards so it can go where it needs to go. And uh, I'm just really, really, really proud of our board and what we're doing. And the, the money is flowing for the, the ones who need it, small and large entities. So thank you so much, uh, Vice President Reese. Just thank you for the presentation. So this is, uh, this is great. Thanks. <laughs> Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you. Yeah, I was just put, trying to put the numbers together. So the, the total is 110000 Correct, $110,000 okay. total. All right. I was looking at your chart. So the amounts requested were the amounts given. Is that right? Mm -hmm. For these projects? Correct. For the, for the three that were For told. the three that were yeah. at requested, yes. Okay. They, yeah. The three requested right, amounts yeah. were the given amounts. Yeah, it might be helpful to put that next column there, uh, okay. amount. Cost requested and then recommended, perhaps <laughs> another okay. column because I'm just trying to put Star the math together. Yeah. Okay. Well, but there's no col just... there's no column that says what they actually are being given. If we were to do a partial, for instance, yeah, yeah that would okay. need to be indicated. So, so anyway, no, um, yeah, very exciting. I'm 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 glad that the two of the jurisdictions work together to exactly. leverage uh, their ass. So, anyways, I look forward to these projects starting as well. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Let me ask you one other, just kidding. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation, very thorough. Okay, we need to move forward. Okay, MSD 2021 and 2022 CIP update. Welcome. Hello, good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. I've got this, okay. Okay, um, thank you for having me. I'm Diana Christie here today to talk to you um, about our capital improvement program. Um, so as you requested um, an update on the, the capital improvement program on the 2021 um, and just kind of recapping 2021, I believe, and our 2022 progress to date, um, just wanted to start by reorienting everyone with um, our capital, I don't know, let me advance one, there we go. Um, so our capital improvement program, as you know, is, um, it's a program uh, that we have to um, do all of the capital work. Um, we manage the legislation funding on an annual basis. So we come to you every year and um, we have the budget approved with an annual amount. Uh, and when you approve that, uh, some of the funds are appropriated during the budget cycle, um, but many of the, the project-specific construction dollars um, are not appropriated at that time, and we come back throughout the year for that funding. Um, but I just think it's important to note, um, because uh, as we were preparing for this presentation today, we, we were really, um, you know, wanted to just give a program overview uh, based on the request. Um, we won't really be getting into specifics on projects, um, just in light of the, you know, the size of the capital program, and when you look at it on an annual basis, we are, um, you know, again, managing um, the budget that way, but the projects all have uh, a life cycle that covers um, execution over several years. Um, so, again, happy to talk about project-specific issues or questions um, if those are um, asked, but today we were prepared to give a presentation mostly on the program and how that's been delivered. Um, as you can see on the agenda, we were going to just um, go through some of the, um, the reporting that was asked about last year just to update and, and share what it is that we are providing regularly um, and then get into the, um, each of the CIP years and then forecast where we're going for 2023. Uh, so first, the county coordination and reporting um, and just generally speaking, so if, if you or any member of the public wanted to know if we had a capital project, if MSD was doing work uh, in your neighborhood, uh, we do have a, um, a, a GIS-based search on our website that is available so that you could just look at, and there's a snapshot of it on the right there on that slide. So this is just a tool 
Um, if you didn't know whether there was an active MSD project either in the planning phases or in, under construction, um, you could search by address or by the map and find information about a project. So this is really just a tool to see if there is something. From there then, you know, you'd really need to contact us to get information and specifics about uh, the project from our customer service team at MSD. But it's a, a very helpful tool just to, to see where we're at, where we're working. Um, and this is everything from you know, some of the smaller lateral replacement projects or sewer replacement projects to our large um, CIP projects. So uh, we have that. We also um, have been coordinating and reviewing monthly reports uh, with the county monitor team. Um, those have been developed over the last, really since last year, we've been preparing um, the capital program delivery report and that is developed monthly. Um, in addition, we put together a CIP project status report. So again, um, where we are able to just track all of the active projects, we have about 193 projects active uh, at any time. So depending on the various stages they're in. So we're developing those monthly. Um, uh, we also coordinate on a weekly basis uh, with the county monitor team just to go through um, individual uh, questions and, and project status. Um, another key part of um, just the overall program management is that we are doing what are called stage gates. Uh, so these are, um, it's an important step in what we've developed for our, our for managing the program and, and so before any project is even included in the in the CIP each year, we are now having what's called a stage gate review session. So we um, really evaluate the project need, the project basis, um, and then you know we, we identify uh, construction or I'm sorry, we identify schedules and budgets and scopes of projects. So that starts from the initiation of a project and then before any project is advanced from the next, uh, from one phase to the next. So planning, design, uh, and then construction, we have a stage gate meeting. Um, so the, there are individuals at MSD that participate on that and the project team comes and presents uh, to explain the project uh, and what the need is. Uh, the county monitor team also participates on that. Okay, so going into our 2021 CIP, so um, this is just a quick recap because uh, again, really, you know, at the, at the end of the year, uh, there aren't always, um, you know, completed projects. Really just depends on, on what projects were part of the CIP that year. Uh, but generally speaking, and these are numbers that we've reported, um, again, in those monthly reports, but we had um, an overall budget of $123 million for 2021. Um, we uh, performed or our expenditures were only about 70% of that for 2021. We did legislate 17 construction projects for about $40 million. <clears throat> um, and just generally, uh, a, lot of what we were a lot of what we did achieve uh, in 2021 was really building out this program management, uh, these program management tools. Uh, we have a new software called eBuilder um, where we track uh, all of our progress, um, all of our um, expenditures and schedules in eBuilder. So all of our projects have now been migrated into that. We're also using uh, software that allows us to um, have real-time dashboards. I think I've talked about that before. So some of the charts you'll see on future pages um, all come from those dashboards that we have that links all of our data together. So we're always looking at the correct um, uh, dollar amounts from, uh, our, from our financial system and can compare that to our our schedules and our milestones. So we've done a lot of work there, um, and then we completed a fair amount of, we did a planning update for the foundational projects that are part of the phase two A planning effort that is going on in conjunction with the county. Um, so that is all, um, that was all completed uh, most of 2021 and, and then uh, completed this year. Um, and of those stage gates I was explaining, so we completed 65 of those in 21. So that's part of you know, really moving those projects along through the project life cycle by the end of the year. Uh, some of the challenges, so again, you know, I, I did mention that really only about 70% uh, on the cash flow for 2021 of what you know, we were budgeting for. Um, some of the challenges and, and why we continue to, to see that um, relate to, you know, I, I 
hate to, to try to blame things on COVID, but the realities of COVID did really set us back on um, you know, a lot of different areas, but I think some of the main things were just our project management, our contract management and procurement activities, so really just getting things um, getting things out to um, notices and, and out to bid, um, you know, really just relies on a lot of people uh, meeting deadlines, getting, getting uh, contracts awarded, and then notices to proceed issued. So that's really just, you know, a matter of catching up from delays. And um, we did have our bridge projects are still a large part of the capital program. The bridge, as you would recall, is um, just the consent decree work that was agreed to be performed between phase one and phase two. Um, the reason those projects have been a challenge just from a schedule standpoint is that they really uh, were not, uh, it, you know, from our standpoint, they really weren't validated prior to committing to those, meaning the scope of work and the budgets and schedules really didn't, um, they hadn't been updated since, you know, in the early 2000s when those projects were put into the WIP. So we committed to doing work on a timetable and under budgets that really, you know, didn't turn out to be um, the case when it came to what actually needed to be done to complete that work. So those are all in process, um, but you know, looking back as to our performance, that's I think part of the reason um, that we were not able to achieve all of the schedule milestones on that. Um, staffing and resources, I'll talk about that again. We definitely um, have, uh, have project managers overworked and that leads to them sometimes being unable to meet some of the timelines to get contracts out. Um, uh, let's see, regulatory uncertainty, just from overall capital planning, uh, it's a challenge still because we um, really haven't uh, had a, an approved um, phase two for our consent decree work. So some of that has been challenging to deliver um, when you look at the long-term capital program. And I've already talked about the contract procurement and the other milestones. Um, so really, I'd like to turn to 2022, so that's this year, um, where we're at with our current CIP, uh, the progress we're making, um, I think things are looking better. Uh, again, this is just recapping what was approved by the board. So our 2022 um, capital improvement program budget was 136 million. So again, just um, reiterating that that isn't $136 million appropriated when you approve that budget. Uh, some of, many of those dollars are um, for construction projects that we come back to you for the approval and the appropriation at that time. Uh, you do appropriate dollars for planning and design, so those projects can get underway once the budget is passed. Um, and then some of the allowance dollars, which are construction dollars, are also appropriated at the beginning of the year. But the breakdown and the goal really for, a, for us to be able to manage a program of this size is to have the appropriate, um, or at least to have a, a good balance of projects in the various phases. So a good balance of planning, design, and construction phases. So we're showing that there in the graphics on the right or on the left just to see that in the planning and design, we've got 36 projects and you can see they're, um, uh, by number, they're split evenly. Of course, more dollars in the design phase as those projects move forward. Um, construction, we had nine projects that were in the budget for about $44 million. Um, today, we have already um, had brought to you construction legislation for, I believe it's seven of those projects, about $25 million. So you have since approved construction legislation um, for uh, the majority of those projects and we'll be um, entering into contracts and, and getting those projects underway here in the remainder of the year. Um, the allowances, again, so the allowances is where we are able to do a lot of the um, uh, really critical work on our collection system in particular. A lot of, um, I'm going to get to that on the next slide, but the, the allowance dollars is, as you can see, um, the graphics explain that uh, we have about 62 million of the budgeted amount is for our allowances and our contingency. So a lot of the work um, a lot of the dollars are not on these, you know, capital projects per se. It is capital expenditures, but they are ongoing expenses for um, upgrades of the assets we have. Let me see. There we go. Okay, so uh, moving into just get into the allowances a little further because this is an area where you really can see um, the performance year after year um, is pretty steady. Uh, so what we're showing here is, are the asset management uh, allowances and the WIP allowances that were approved in the budget. 
Um, these dollars um, are represented in the, in the blue. The green shows where we've encumbered funds. So this means that we have a contract underway, we have the dollars encumbered, um, and we're able to get that work done in the year that you budgeted it. So I think the, the key allowances that um, I wanted to talk about are our construction allowances. So we have our wastewater collection system, which again, it's all of the sewers uh, that we have. We have over 3,000 miles of sewers in our system. Many of those, as you know, are, are old um, sewers installed in some cases 200 years ago. Uh, and we have a pretty robust system to track where we have um, risk of um, structural risk or maintenance risk. Uh, and we do planned repairs and we do um, also emergency repairs. So the, the largest allowance that prioritized wastewater collection system improvements um, where you can see the dollars were, um, I think it is about, was it 18 million? Um, I think it was 18 million, I don't have the exact amount. Um, but that, so those dollars we have encumbered all of the funds that were budgeted and we have all of that work underway. And what we use that um, particular allowance for is really, um, it's really t two main purposes. It would be to do some of our um, planned prioritized work on our most high risk sewers where we have to do some kind of a repair, re usually a replacement. We have to dig in and, and replace a segment of the sewer. Um, but what often is the case, and, and generally, um, we spend a lot of that money on our emergency sewer repairs. So we've had, you know, we have various um, emergencies that arise throughout the year and we're able to use this funding to do those repair work, do that repair work. Um, the main sewer renewal program is another big and important tool that we have to do um, to do work on our sewers. Uh, the main sewer renewal allowance is actually, um, it's consent decree allowance, so that funding counts toward our, our consent decree spend. And this is where we are able to um, repair and rehabilitate our main sewers using trenchless technology. So this is the lining work where we go in and we can reline our sewers um, and, and you know be able to uh, upgrade them that way. So overall, um, the wastewater collection allowances in total um, are about 25 million. And we do, um, we, we spent that money in 2021 and we expect to spend that money again in 2022. Uh, and this is really, you know, some of the critical construction work that we're doing. So um, this figure here, this is some of the, you know, the, the tools that we have now with the, um, the program that I was mentioning and, and the reporting that we're providing monthly. So we track our cash flow monthly. And what you see here on this slide is um, through the end of May, we don't have everything um, through June, the end of June yet, all those um, you know, will come out here in the next week or so. Um, but what you can see is that our program cash flow for 2022 is on track. So this means that the dollars um, are being spent. Uh, some months we have uh, larger spend than others, um, but it, the red line there shows the actual spend uh, through May, and the black through the end of the year shows that we are on target this year to be um, uh, within the 90% range of our planned cash flow. So that would be better than our past performance uh, in terms of you know, really sticking with um, and, and getting the projects uh, encumbered and the, the money spent this year. Um, Historically, and, and as I mentioned in 2021, we were in the 70% 70, 70 range. And we do anticipate that we do, we do see some delays. Um, we had a project that had to be rebid, as you know, um, based on the, um, it, it exceeding the, the um, engineer's estimate. Um, and then we just have some other challenges still with our contracting. Um, so I know that, you know that performance may not be uh, exactly at 90%, but we're still really pleased to see that we're on track this year. Um, so I just kind of wanted to get in some general observations. Uh, again, I think um, here you can see, we're noting we, we do have 193 active projects. So those are all in various phases this year. Um, we have about 63 in planning, 66 in design, 33 in construction and 31 in closeout, meaning we completed construction and we're in contract closeout phase. Um, we are certainly seeing um, challenges from a resource standpoint and um, our current staffing, we, we have um, 11 project managers. So you can imagine, you know, almost 200 projects 
Um, each, each individual is carrying quite a workload, um, and, and that really you know, presents challenges in be able, being able to meet the schedule. Um, we do have you know, supervising engineers, um, and we have uh, management, but the project managers that are you know, responsible for the day-to-day -day work, you know, are really, um, we need to add resources there. Uh, we have a lot of other projects um, that are, you know, coming down to, you know, the end of the year and going into next year. We're going to, you know, we're continuing to need to sign new projects to these project managers. Um, we have made some efforts, and you can see here, for our procurement process. So, again, really getting, getting those um, RFQs and RFPs out is a process. It's a lot of coordination at MSD and with the city, um, and that's one area where we've made some uh, We've taken some steps recently to develop a procurement liaison and really centralize that, um, that work. Uh, and I think that um, we'll start to see, we hope to see some progress on that uh, in the latter half of the year. Um, this is a, a key initiative for us is to really break through some of those procurement uh, issues where you know, we, we have months go by without progress on getting an a RFQ or an RFP um, from the beginning to the end of that process. Uh, it's an important, obvious, uh, obviously a very important uh, part of what we do is, is getting those um, projects out to bid and um, the, the evaluation of, of all the proposals. Um, we have, you know, committees and so all of that needs to be, um, we need to follow uh, all those processes, but it's just, um, you know, it takes a lot of time and a lot of people in coordination. Um, again, mentioned that program cash flow and the encumbrances. Um, I think the other uh, just general comment I wanted to make on uh, 2022 and overall is uh, if you've been looking at any of the reports we've been putting together monthly, we've developed a lot of these KPIs or key performance indicators based on metrics um, for schedule and budget for all of our projects. And those metrics are things that we developed internally um, that we really didn't have before. So MSD, um, you know, of course, has always had a large capital program and we've managed it in different ways. but to develop um, these metrics to then measure ourselves off of and to continue to improve our performance is something that we've really you know, invested in and, and um, Stantec and our program management team in coordination with the county you know, has um, really you know, built something that then will allow us to continue to improve and track our progress. But when you look at um, an individual project, we have about 45 milestones um, and some of those you know, we see as we uh, as we continue to learn about our own process that they need to be adjusted a little bit. So we may be showing that we're behind our milestones, but the real impact of that could just be perhaps that our milestone wasn't correct um, or didn't reflect the realities of, of the work that needs to be done. So there's a lot of adjustments still taking place, but um, for now, having all that um, framework in place, it's allowing us, again, to, to look at our program and to measure and have these KPIs that you can you know, have a better understanding of um, our performance on a program level. Um, I did just want to briefly mention the 2023 CIP because it's already July, so a month from now we will be presenting to the board um, a draft CIP um, that's generally provided on August 15th, and that is our, um, our plan this year. So we will have a draft CIP um, that then we can have discussions about. Um, our um, goal there is to have a CIP book um, reflective of the foundational projects um, that have been part of phase 2A discussions. Um, of course, it will have the same allowance expenditures, asset management expenditures um, that we have seen in past years. Um, we are, again, you know, the, the, the um, I guess, uh, general goals of ours is to have that a balance, again, of planning, design, and construction to staff ourselves appropriately to be able to manage that work going forward and, and stick to um, the schedules and the, the funding appropriations that the board provides. Um, projects being executed on a multi-year life cycle, again, um, when we give you the CIP, when we, when we request the annual budget, we present it as a five-year planning budget. Um, the out, outlying years don't have the dollars appropriated, but that's part of the overall you know, five-year CIP plan. With that, um, I'd like to turn to questions. Again, we'd be, uh, I have folks here with me, many familiar faces, um, to dig into any of these issues more, or if the board, um, you know, our goal is to, to answer questions you have, and if you're more interested in project level updates, 
Um, we'd be happy to do that uh, at any time, come in and talk about specific projects, whether in the planning, design, um, or construction phase. Thank, thank you. you so much for your presentation. Um, also, thank you for getting the information in advance. Um, and excited about the fact that um, the cash flow is on track, so that's great. Um, any projects that we may want to have further discussion on, we certainly can do when you come back in two weeks, if that's uh, you and Karen, I'm sure, and Holly can talk about uh, the next agenda item uh, in two weeks from now. Um, just a general comment I have, I'll wait. Uh, Vice President Reese, if you had any specific comments on the presentation. Uh, yes, thank you. I uh, just want to go back to the delivery status. Um, on here, you talk about <coughs> MSD, you mentioned it twice, retooling the current procurement process and implementing a centralized procurement liaison. Can you get to uh, a little more specific on that? What, what are we doing currently with the procurement process and mm -hmm. what's the difference with the retool? Is it just the liaison or is it something else that you're doing with the on the procurement side yeah sure um so with procurement we really aren't talking retooling the process from the standpoint of the city's um, procurement procedures and the rules we follow of course those are um, you know established and and we utilize the city's um, purchasing division everything that we um, need to uh, purchase or have a contract let for goes through the purchasing purchasing division um, and then to the city manager. So the, the things that we're trying to do is internally at MSD, I mean, we have a very large, you know, um, book of work to get out of out MSD to coordinate with the purchasing division at the city uh, and to the city manager. Um, so anything we can do on our end to, to streamline that process um, will help, you know, then when it's kind of out of our hands. So I'm really just talking, it's more of a, a business, um, you know, an internal business improvements. And we, so each project manager is responsible for having, you know, if they, they're, they're now going into the design phase, for example, um, and we need to have a consultant um, on board for that design engineering work, the RFQ process, um, you, you know, put together a procurement summary that goes downtown. Um, then they put out an RFQ um, and we establish a committee. So a lot of the, the busy work part is on our side and having all that um, on the project manager's plate without a lot of assistance can just be a challenge for them, again, because they have a large workload. So we're trying to help them by having a uh, one staff member whose job it is is to get that procurement, you know, from the project manager and to the city's purchasing division. Um, and, you know, it's, so again, it's really kind of more of a staffing thing than a change in the process of, um, you know, putting those RFQ, RFQs out and then there's the selection committee. All of that is, you know, really a standard process, but um, it's just kind of tracking the, the timeline of it and making sure it's not sitting on someone's desk for a while. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. and, um, Help me understand where would that person fit in the org chart? Are they at the executive level or would they be at uh, what level is this person? That's a good question. So right now, this is actually a contracted liaison. Um, so we have a program management team. Um, Todd Papes, has, um, who is here with me today, um, is uh, the manager of the, that um, uh, consultant team that assists us with kind of putting all of these program uh, tools in place for us, um, but we do have uh, individuals in our, um, they're not at the executive level, they're more at, um, it's a senior analyst position um, that work on things like our, our SBE program um, and our procurement generally for all of MSD. And so the goal would be once we kind of build up a process in engineering that that would then be at our, um, you know, an administrative staff member for MSD would be managing that going forward so so you're saying currently you have a contracted consultant that handles putting all these pieces or managing all these pieces and you're going to move from a contractor to now um, adding uh, adding to your uh, your table in terms of a staff member now would be handling that or will you still be having the consultants plus a staff member um, well, two things. One, the uh, the consultant um, is acting as a liaison, so um, 
I wouldn't say, you know, again, the project manager is still ultimately responsible for that yeah, no, piece no, of I, it. I got that part. I'm just going by what you said. You said MSD is retooling mm -hmm. the current procurement process. And you're telling me that currently you have a contractor person as a liaison. You said you're retooling it and implementing a centralized procurement liaison. So I just want to figure out what's yeah. the difference. Like, what are you doing now? Do you have a consultant now doing that? And are and you're saying you're retooling it? Are you getting rid of that consultant and then hire an inside person that's going to do that? I just that's what I'm trying to. What was what's yeah, the difference? Sorry there, that for that confusion. So the the current process is that we have the liaison that is the consultant helping us, you know, retool this. Um, Previously, it was just all the individual project managers then working with purchasing. The goal going forward is to not have the consultant liaison doing that long term, but to then um, have that, that work performed by, and it's actually, we have existing staff, um, they're just not really managing it department wide. Uh, so I don't believe that the, that the long term goal would be that we would necessarily need a new staff member for that it's really more kind of building it up as a role and then assigning that to somebody uh department in our that we already have at msd got you now at msd you're divided into uh union employees mm -hmm. and non-union employees would this new staff person that's what i was saying would they be at the executive level of, of a don because i'm sure if it's a union position it would have to be a different uh, you'd have to go cross the street and make sure and there's process to HR because we're trying to figure out you get because the way we're set up um, and certainly I'm limited in what I can say but I just need to know mentally and understand it on paper are you adding an executive level position to this with this procurement liaison be at an executive level or be at a union level as it stands currently, because it's in a consultant, it you know it's not really comparable. Uh, but that's well, not. I know you got the consultant, yeah. but you put on here you retooling. You ain't yes. going with a consultant. You going with something different. So I just wanted to kind of understand. Yeah, I mean honestly, what's, what's we have. I, ha I haven't. We haven't pieced that all together. But keep in mind, we have the code union. So our code union is mid-level management, and I think that this is the kind of work that would fall within the duties of some of our existing um, code positions that we have. So gotcha. that's where I would see this, you know, as we were making some other, um, you know, just organizational, um, not necessarily changes within our existing TO, really just looking at um, people's, you know, individuals' assignments and what they're working on. And really, you know, this has been something I've been working on a while at MSD, but we were very siloed in the past. We have seven divisions, so we have admin staff in each one of the divisions, which is necessary in, in a lot of respects. They all have their own budgets to manage, and payroll is challenging to, to centralize. But, um, but we want to make sure we also have a centralized, you know, um, role where we know what one another are doing. And that was lost, I feel like, in some respects over time. So this is another area where I feel like leaving all of the procurement tasks up to each division and you know, even down to a project manager creates inefficiencies. So having it more centralized um, and organized you know, yeah. back up through the director as well. But yeah. it isn't really an effort to create anything new, to be honest. It's gotcha. Yeah, with I our don't existing question structure. Your, yeah. you know, how you organize, and I'm just trying to get an understanding from our perspective of, in terms of an organizational chart, we're moving from consultant to now a person, and I just wanted to know where did that person mm -hmm. fall on the organizational uh, chart. Um, my second and last question on this part, and I'm sure uh, my colleagues have more questions. Uh, last time you did mention it this, in this report, and I appreciate that, it just, me still being trying to put my arms around. I mean, MSD is very complicated to put your arms around. Um, you had mentioned last time we had testified there were a number of projects that kind of got pushed back, pushed to the side for a number of reasons, whether it was supply chain, and uh, we were talking about using different type of, uh, uh, correct me if I say the wrong word, piping, some kind of, we were using one vendor and we had to go to another one because we couldn't get that anymore and some of it was more expensive some of them were less expensive but there was concern about some of these projects that 
people had been waiting and wanting to get moving and they were happy about getting it moving. Uh, Commissioner Driehaus may can uh, elaborate a lot more on some of those projects, but there was some question about, well, we got to hold off. Are we caught up based on where we are supposed to be? Uh, have we caught up on those projects? Uh, is that something that is reported out to those communities that were, had been waiting? Are we now caught up, uh, meaning, you know, since COVID, are we now exactly on track of what we want it to be? Or are some of those projects still kind of lagging and we're trying to catch up? Um, I want to make sure I'm, I'm not sure exactly which projects you're referencing, but generally speaking, I wouldn't say we're caught up completely. I mean, there are projects that, and so to the extent you're referencing some of the projects that were uh, part of our, our bridge, uh, which is the, the consent decree work that we committed to do for phase two, um, there are still, I believe, five projects um, that are in process that have, you know, and, and at this point, you know, they're all proceeding, um, but they, they're not completed uh, and they were delayed in terms of their start date. But uh, there really isn't anything that is currently holding up uh, any of those projects at present. So there's nothing, you know, that we're yeah. challenged by to presenting them. So I, I think from the standpoint of um, what we need to do to keep, you know, to get things moving, uh, you know, all of those um, hurdles have been cleared and things are progressing. Gotcha. So all the challenges on your challenge page have been addressed. Obviously, COVID-19 is not <laughs> over, so you can't address that. But no. you don't hear bridge project staffing and resources, marketing conditions and bid prices, regulatory uncertainty of phase A, 2A program, contract procurement, achieving planning design, NTP milestones. All those things that's in your hands has now been corrected from 2021, and we on track in 2022. Am I correct? Uh, understand that or, or 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 what's on here is still a challenge that has not been correct has not been addressed yeah so i we do still have some of those challenges uh there aren't any new challenges with COVID. i think that was just you know those are just some yeah, ongoing yeah. delays um in the bridge again um there those projects are still and there are some still underway no no real challenges to date um the staffing and resources is something that is um, a current challenge and you know really um, as we move into potentially more work um, or larger projects under phase two, that is going to be something where, you know, we, we foresee the need for um, additional staffing at MSD to, to deliver this size of a program. Um, the market conditions and bid prices is out of our hands, but we are managing that, you know, as best as we can. Um, there, there are some things we uh, plan to do, and these are things we talk with the county monitor team about um, with larger projects. To, uh, to kind of eliminate some of the risks. So there's different delivery methods, like design, doing projects through a design build delivery method. Um, we've seen results of that with some of our past projects um, where we are able to at least reduce the risk of, of fluctuating prices a little bit better. Uh, so that's something you'll see, I think, here going forward is more desire to do design build projects. Um, but the rest of it, you know, again, those, those milestones are things that we're adjusting internally, and I think we made a lot of progress there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna skip around just a little bit. Glad you're coming in so often so we can uh, have the Q&A. Um, so I wanted to start with the bridge. I did get um, an update on the status of the bridge projects. <clears throat> um, 15 are completed. Um, of the projects, six were finished late, and then we've got five that are not yet completed, so they are obviously running late. But it, to hear you just say they're all on track um, to be completed, do you have a time frame for when these last ones might be completed, part of the bridge? I could ask one of uh, the folks here. With, okay, yeah, so they'll all be in construction this year. Okay. Which, but, you know, that could then be nine to 12 months. I was gonna ask you that, yeah, okay. Any, yeah. But I, I think the ones that still need to be um, uh, put out to bid is uh, CSO 513 and then 83472, is that right? Okay, so two of the five um, you'll be legislating funds for yet. Okay, 
this year. Okay. My 13th bid. We're hoping to have NTP next month. Okay. And the other projects, so some of those will have 12 month construction, so they will extend it to next year for sure. Oh, right. Sounds yeah. like it. Yeah. Okay. All right. But but I, it's good to, to see it in front of us, right? That where the bridge projects are, um, what the status is. So um, leads into. I've just got a couple other things. So. When you talk about your um, graph for where we've been by way of delays and where we are, um, so, and I think I heard you say that last year there was a 70% completion rate or so, um, and, there, and then you, you know, we've gone through the challenges related to COVID, supply chain, employees, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm surprised to see your optimism uh, in your chart here. And so I'm wondering if you can give me the rationale behind the optimism um, to say that, you know, you anticipate, which I'm glad, by the way, that uh, the expectation is that 90% of the projects will be complete this year. But given the track record here, I'm just surprised by that. And I'm wondering what your rationale is. So I think the key distinction there is that that is a cash flow um, report. And so cash flow doesn't always um, track the, the projects um, that we expected to have the expenditures on. Um, and so, and, and in fact, this might be a good opportunity to have Todd come up and explain, but right now, you know, showing that we are on, on track from a cash flow perspective, you know, in any given year, we may have uh, expenditures uh, on a project either exceeding what we anticipated or um, you know, we may have some delayed something from last year that we then had expenditures this year. And so that, that can you know, show, it, which ultimately you know, from a cash flow perspective, I think you know, it is an important thing for us to measure and track regardless of whether or not it matches the, the expenditures we expected you know, cause right. it, from a larger perspective of the budgeting. Um, but it, it doesn't mean that will be 90 percent. Well, that's okay. So let me rephrase my question. Uh, so, all right. So the measure is cash flow. And I, I then I, my, yes. my curiosity is, you know, is that what we looked like last year um, when we came in 70 percent, really? So what, then let me restate this. So if, if 90 percent is cash flow, what do you anticipate by way of projects completed? For, it, it, what I'm getting at is that we've been running behind. Um, on bridge projects, on other projects, and, I, and I, I'm not criticizing so much as just acknowledging the fact that we've been running behind. And so I'm wondering what we should anticipate as we work through some of the challenge that, challenges you have identified, um, and I'm going to ask a, a little bit about those as well, just so we know what to anticipate um, as a board, as the, the group that, it, you know, allows for the funds to move forward um, in different amounts as, as requested. Um, I just don't have a sense of what you, th what you might project for this year by way of projects completed that would mirror whatever you, know, you were using to come up with the 70% for, for last year. But so I just want to clarify, yes, we were saying though 70, I was comparing apples to apples. So 70% cash flow compared okay. to 90%. So let's so, not talk about cash flow, let's yes. talk about projects completed. Um, so uh, one thing I want to add, and, and then Todd, you can probably help, but um, I, I think when you look at the overall budget for the CIP, a large portion of that is our allowance, um, or the allowance uh, funds. And you know, so the good thing is those dollars are tracking and, and we expect to spend 100% on those on that work. And that's you know, construction of, um, and repair of our, our large sewers. So that work and, you know, and the total, you know, somewhere between 25, 30 million dollars, we we'll be on track and we'll spend that. The other projects, um, absent the bridge projects, you know, there aren't schedule milestones that were, you know, outside of our own milestones that we set. But you can share a little bit more, I think, about where we expect to be from a project standpoint. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Todd Papes, the, the program manager for MSD. Um, I think it's important to have a distinction and understand when we talk about completion of projects, that that is distinctly different than when we look at the CIP. As Diana noted, almost every project MSD embarks on is a multi-year project. So when we talk about completion rates, we need to talk about kind of a long-term picture on those projects. Similar to when we discuss a like wet weather program, that might be a 10-year horizon that we're talking about and talking about the performance on it. 
the KPIs that we're presenting here today are really around the CIP, and that's, that's an annual 12-month kind of artificial constraint. Uh, the key pieces of that are, are the legislation of it, and we kind of take a look at that, the encumbrance of that to put it on a contract, then obviously the spend on it. So there's a lot of different pieces go into that, but that, that it's important not to correlate a 90% cash flow expenditure against the planned baseline with 90% completion of projects because those are occurring over completely different timelines and they overlap over different CIP years as well. That makes sense. So while I appreciate that information, um, what I'm truly, truly getting at here is do, it, we have been given information about challenges, about COVID, about, you know, and we hear this across the board. We hear it about parking garages, we hear about sewers, we hear about a lot of things. So I'm just trying to get a better understanding of you know, we, we kind of know where we have been. We've been behind. Um, where and when do we expect, if we can, you know, project into the future here, to turn a corner where we are not running behind and we get up to speed on some of the projects? And, and I think we all understand that these are very long-term projects. Um, we get that. It's a big infrastructure. Um, but I'm trying to better understand where, where we are as an organization by way of what we've dedicated ourselves to do and, and what we've literally committed to do by way of the money and um, how on time we can expect to be within, I don't know, the next 12 months or the next 24 months and, and can you project that kind of thing? The way we project that is as projects are approved in the CIP and we encumber them onto a contract, there is a baseline budget and schedule established. That project is measured against that baseline. So when we talk about being on time or kind of on schedule, it's the performance against that baseline schedule is important. That baseline is kind of redone every year. So if you look at you know a slate of 190 projects, each one of those would be measured against kind of that baseline performance. Now, the concept of catching up is difficult. Every pro you know, no project goes exactly as planned. Schedules do move. We do have variances, pluses and minuses. Um, you know, with COVID, with some of the staffing issues, you know, your challenges in getting a project put out for an RFQ, getting under contract and then starting initiation of planning, for instance, will have a cascading effect on the design and construction of that project. As long as that's captured in the baseline, technically that is not a delay of the project, but it could, for instance, impact some of the, the cash flow. Industry standard on you know most utilities running on a kind of a cash flow basis is about 80% of what's projected. So, you know MSD's not been off the mark very far historically. This year, kind of on track to actually exceed that. So that, I don't think that's a good indicator necessarily that you're behind schedule. Um, I do think there's acknowledgement that we have had some challenges getting projects started up in planning and then moved through into design. There has been some challenges with some of the pricing and market conditions and causing rebids on projects, which again adds time and delays a little bit. So all of those are kind of being addressed through the project delivery systems, the use of eBuilder, kind of centralizing some of these functions, getting resources to the PMs to, to make sure that we harden these processes, we kind of codify them into eBuilder, and we're trying to drive kind of consistency, efficiency, and predictability in where we're going long term. But you know, I, I do share kind of Diana's concerns that you know, we're, we're, we're fighting the good battle today with what we're dealing with, but there is, there is a phase two way out there from a regulatory perspective. It is going to have likely additional dollars and it's likely going to have some very large, complicated projects. And we need the ability to kind of forecast what are we going to need to be successful with those. And to manage that kind of large program, you need to know kind of three things. You need to know your fiscal constraints, the duration and delivery of that program, and which projects are going to be in the portfolio. And today, we don't know the duration, we don't know the fiscal constraints, and we've got some clarity on the projects, but even that is, is really going to be a function of what the, the overall affordability will be. So we're kind of flying on a one-year one year basis, and in reality what you want to be doing is going, I can see out 10 years and plan accordingly. And we're not quite there yet, we're waiting on kind of this affirmation of what this next phase is going to be. That said, we are working hard to put in place all the programmatic tools and platforms that would allow people to be efficient in the execution of the work, assuming we've got the right number of people to, to match up with the workload once that is determined. So I, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just trying to build confidence in myself that, you know, if we, you know, we will be uh, passing a budget for MSD at the end of the year. Yep. We're going to have that budget next month. I want to know what I'm looking at. I, I want to know that we have some confidence that we will, uh, you know, when I look at the bridge projects, 
and five of them are not yet complete, it, it concerns me. I mean, they're behind. I mean, everybody acknowledges they're behind. Um, so I, I just want to get a better understanding, and, and maybe it's not today's conversation, but um, I want to get a better understanding of what we anticipate, because when we are asked then to allocate dollars for these projects, we want to get some some level of competence that there is a timeline, and there always is, right? But a timeline that makes sense, given whatever the impacts and challenges are in the market, um, and what we should anticipate. That's kind of what I'm, I'm getting at, and I, I guess we'll have that conversation when, when the budget comes forward. Um, but that's, I'm not trying to be, I'm trying to understand it. I'm really not trying to be critical. I'm trying to understand the reason for the delays, um, what we can anticipate, and how we build into beyond what you're already doing by way of changing things, and, and Diane's already described that, but um, how you build in that kind of information so that we all are kind of landing in the same place. So that's kind of what I'm getting at. Well, um, maybe, maybe to help that sense of optimism, I mean, a couple of things that have been implemented that are different than what occurred during the bridge is there is a lot of vetting that goes into the definition of a project before it is nominated into the CIP. So Diana referred to the stage gate meeting. There is now a pretty rigid process that goes through and it, and it accomplishes a very important step. It, it creates a, a validation of the baseline budget and project estimate and the schedule. That, if you don't have a good starting point, there's no idea where you're gonna end up at. When that bridge program was put together, the projects that were assembled for creation of the bridge were not validated. They were, they were taken as is at face value from 2006 to 10. Things have obviously changed since then, so your starting point was well off the mark of reality, and the result is that you end up with projects that, that's, that's likely how they were supposed to finish, but we didn't understand that when that got agreed to. What we are pushing hard for now through the systems we're implementing is to have a true understanding of a good starting point, so let's make sure we have validated and we understand the actual cost estimate of the project, and we're going through steps to do that. Let's make sure that we build a schedule and a baseline that is realistic of the project complexity, and that we believe we can be successful in achieving and use that as the starting point to launch those. At this point in time, when you get the CIP book for next year, the projects that are proposed to be in it will have gone through that step. That is not a step that existed when the bridge program was launched prior. So there, there is some changes that have occurred that will help improve that process. So that should give you some, some optimism towards the performance going forward. Okay, well, at least a better understanding of you know, where we're going. Um, okay, so I have a couple other questions for Diana. Mm -hmm. Thank you, appreciate it. Alrighty. I think, at least I think they're for Diana. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've talked a little bit about some of the challenges. So where are we on staffing? What is the status of staffing right now? Do you know? Um, you mean in terms of uh, whether we have, uh, need additional Numbers. funding? Yep. Um, I don't, I, I don't have that uh, exactly with me today to present. I mean, um, can you get it for next time? Yeah, just I so can we definitely have, bring that next yeah. time. And okay. that's something we're, we're working on as part of our, our budget. Well, you've talked request. about the potential need for more staffing, so I'm yes. trying to level set. Where are we on staffing? Because you came in last time with the operating budget, um, and I want to, again, put some context around what is going to be requested this year. And so I want to know what the status of staffing is now. Um, and, and you will, through the operating budget, describe what you um, anticipate. Um, and, and just so, yeah. uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But I mean, we, for, f with respect to the, the project management staff that, you know, manages these projects, um, we have, uh, so we have three supervising engineers and 11 project managers that kind of make up the team that, you know, delivers these projects that have projects assigned to them that we divvy, you know, the 193 projects up. Um, so that's, you know, those are the numbers that I have in front of me today, but, but what, what we need, um, who else is part of that team, you know, I, I think I'd rather give you that with a little bit more. Okay. No, that's, yeah. that's great. I don't need to write research. away. Okay. Um, and the other thing that uh, comes to mind is we've talked about the delays. Um, what is, um, the long-term impact, I guess, of delays um, financially when we've got projects like that that are, are um, finishing out later than expected as prices have gone up. Do you, have you an analysis of that? We have not done a, an analysis of that. I think um, there's a lot of factors that would make, you know, putting a number to it actually can in some cases be a benefit. We didn't spend the money. There's some time value of money, um, and it's really impossible for us to know what things would have 
you know, and we know there's increases, um, but we can't necessarily, you know, put a number on that. Um, so, you know, it really just, I think the larger issue is delaying these projects means, um, you know, we're at larger risk for, for emergencies, for failures in many cases, depending on what the project is intended to accomplish, um, or there's, you know, um, real impact environmentally or from a public health standpoint if it's something that's, you know, a CSO problem. So, um, I mean, you know, but I, I think sometimes you can say there's a benefit to delay from a financial perspective because that money has been in, a, in an account. And well, uh, however, prices are going up. So, and we, we've done this analysis by way of our garages uh, to get a better understanding of some of the um, projects where the costs are they're going up and we, we, we're putting out bids that aren't even relevant anymore because you know they're two months old and so I'm asking for that same and it doesn't have to be a fine finely you know honed analysis I'm just asking with uh, the delays the what we know that uh, supply chains impacting things and prices are going up I'm just wondering again this is all in the context of the budget um, what the delays mean to the budget and if maybe there is a project or two that have completed recently and you could look at the budgeted amount versus the actual spend and give us a sense of that, um, I, you know, I think that might be helpful by way of context moving into the, um, the budget okay. in August. Um, and I think that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. Just a couple comments. Um, so when you come before us um, for the budget for the CIP and operating budget, I guess I should say, who are you coming before? Uh, what entity are you coming to to get approval of the budget? Who are you coming in front of? Uh, we come before the board to approve the budget. The board of commissioners? Yes. Okay. And the reason why I say that, I guess I'm being sarcastic a little bit. About three years ago, I asked about the information that's put out and why everything has Cincinnati on it, and we own MSD. MSD, Metropolitan Sewer District of Greater Cincinnati, and a fantastic picture of city of Cincinnati. It's not a trivial issue because we're trying to stop uh, the confusion with MSD. We own this thing. I mean, I mean, last time you were here, we had approved a 3% increase in salaries and but then ended up being five percent that's just a a little bit of some of the confusion but i don't know why there's such a hesitancy uh, and i'll say i know it was before you came uh, uh vice president reese i said can we put hamilton county matter of fact our color is blue it could go right up here anything that you transmit on your website or whatever nobody would know that hamilton county really has anything to do are, am I confusing you? You looked a little confused. Can you, you agreed three years ago, two and a half years ago, to show some indication that Hamilton County is involved in this process and you are going to be coming to us to prove all these millions of dollars and we're nowhere in this. We never are. Um, and not that I really want to, you know, MSD has a lot of issues that we're trying to deal with, so it might be, be careful what you ask for, but because this is um, taxpayer money and we're talking about millions of dollars, and I know you come before us, but you would never know that we have anything to do with MSD. And so when you come in two weeks, whatever you bring us, uh, we have, a matter of fact, a couple uh, Hamilton County logos that you can use on here and also on your website, some indication that Hamilton County has something to do with all these millions that you're asking us to approve. So I certainly would appreciate that. So other than that, that's all I have. And so we'll be seeing you in two, two weeks, right? Okay. Yes, I will be back yes, in two uh -huh. weeks. One clarifying question, um, Diana, and this may be for you, maybe for Todd, I'm not sure, but, and this kind of gets at a, a question I think the Commissioner Driehaus was asking um, about the, the scheduling on the project, specifically on the, I'm um, thinking about the WIP project. So I know of the total number of WIP projects that we had, there was a subset of those, I won't talk numbers or anything, but there was a subset that was defined as being with negative float. Um, and I just wanted to know uh, just a little bit more information about that and whether the the, the negative float on those specific projects were 
Um, uh, were there remedy plans that were associated with those? Do we think that some of those can be pulled back in? Are some of them, uh, is there a subset of them that we believe are just going to be late at the, at the conclusion? And I don't necessarily need an answer now, but, but offline, an email to Holly or, or however you want, want to do it, unless you have something you're, you wanted to uh, comment on now. But I just wanted to get a, a sense is, uh, while that's a snapshot in time, is that subset able to be remedied from a schedule perspective um, or, or not on, on a project by project basis? Well, I can address um, that generally. Uh, so the only projects that, you know, the WIP projects that are active right now that we're tracking are the bridge projects. And we do produce a, um, a monthly update. It's just kind of a one pager. And so that's, that's probably what you're referring to where we have um, whether they're completed, whether they were completed late, um, or whether they're still in progress, and if there's negative float. So, right. um, so those projects are the ones we were mentioning before. There are only five that are still um, incomplete. And you know, so that's where you would see that, um, that negative float is still uh, you know, being tracked in the sense that those milestones have already passed. Okay. Um, all but right. all of the, I, I, you know, I would say, um, and this is something we've reported on in the quarterly um, consent decree reports as well, what steps we took to mitigate those delays to bring things back on schedule. I, I believe, you know, really, I think at this point in time, we've done everything we can, and those are um, soon to all be in the construction phase. And, you know, so there's, um, you know, I think they're all on track now, and I don't believe there's much more from an accelerating them you know, we can do, but okay. so I, can, I can provide a little bit more context. Yeah, if, if you could, that's how I was just looking at, at opportunities to, to accelerate. You may have answered it earlier. If so, I, I apologize. I just didn't catch that in the presentation. So, um, but yeah, that's, I was just looking at opportunities to accelerate or whether, or the, whether that had passed on a project by project basis. So, okay. Thanks, Diana. All right. Thank I you. Have, I have one additional question. Um, what's your tenure with MSD? How long have you been a consultant with MSD? I've been here since uh, 2016. Okay, thank you. Can yeah. I ask you to bring one other piece of information yeah. back? You mentioned um, the amount of pipe that was upgraded per year and a significant amount of the money going to that. Can you, when you come back, give us a uh, better understanding of how much pipe we're talking about, how many miles of pipe per year you're, you're able to upgrade? Yes, we can provide numbers on thank that. You. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. you. Okay, thank you. All right, we have one additional item. And it is, I'd like to make a motion to, to go to executive session pursuant to RC section 121.22 G3 to conduct a conference with an attorney to discuss imminent litigation. Second. Commissioner Summer Dumas? Yes. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes. 